Okay, so again, since I'm the um, MC for this event and also uh, the presenter, I'm going to introduce myself. <laughs> um, I want to thank you guys for inviting me. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I invited myself. Um, <laughs> uh, I am, uh, let's see, I've been on the board for about five years of Champaign County Audubon. I am the former president and current vice president, and I've served on the program committee. I've served on the communications committee. Um, so all the things you see on social media are, are me. Um, and I love this role because it gives me the opportunity to share all of the things that I find really wonderful about Illinois with all of you. Uh, one of the things I started doing this year um, as part of my pandemic uh, wish list was, you know, kind of compiling videos and photos that I've taken and kind of just generating a lot more content. You know, I was spending a lot of time out in the garden, spending a lot of time hiking and exploring. And, um, you know, I just started documenting a lot of the critters and the um, nature that I was seeing. And so when thinking about something to do for this presentation, and this being my last uh, presentation with Champaign County Audubon, I thought, why don't I just give a presentation and show off all of the fun, um, you know, pictures and uh, things I've seen over my years in Illinois. Um, and I also was unable to do field work this year. I'm a graduate student at the University of Illinois, and I usually do field work in Florida. And so I travel down to the Panhandle and I work on um, studying a rare mint that lives in the Panhandle. And I wasn't able to go this summer. And it was a big bummer for me because I love working outdoors. So I needed kind of a creative outlet. So I just started um, making more videos and, um, I don't want to say blogging because I don't really write that much, but I put together a um, kind of an online magazine called Midwest Explorer. And it's really cool because it's collaborative. I invite other people to write pieces to include in the magazine. And it's meant to be kind of, um, you know, a science-based horticultural magazine that's focused on the ecology and the, um, you know, gardening in the Midwest. So, um, if you want to view that, you can find me on, on social media or um, on my website, which I will also put in the chat, um, which is Sarah Ann Johnson at wordpress.com. That before I forget. And uh, you can download a PDF copy of it there too. So if you are interested in contributing anything, please let me know because I would love to um, I would love to hear about what you'd like to contribute. But today we are going to talk about Illinois' natural areas. Um, some of them include my own backyard. Uh, I really enjoy gardening. Um, I also, of course, love birding, being part of the Champaign County Audubon Society. I think it's kind of a given. Um, that center picture of me there is um, in Florida with my study species, Macbridia alba. Very sweaty because <laughs> it's June in the panhandle. Um, but that is one of my massive sunflowers, which is a pride and joy of mine because um, a lot of friends of mine would drive by and say that they could see it from uh, one of the main roads, which was really fun to know. Um, so really, yeah, I just love being outside. I love documenting everything that I see outside and trying to learn as much as possible. And I think if you love nature and you love the outdoors, you can um, find things to love about any, any area. And our backyard is definitely um, something we've cultivated over the past few years to be a beacon for wildlife. Uh, we plant a lot of native plants. And when we first moved here, we had almost nothing in our garden. There was a few peonies and maybe some tulips and some other things, but um, generally it was really empty. And we fully transformed it into, you know, borders filled with native plants. Um, our front walk has a nice little pollinator patch that uh, gives me a lot of joy when people stop and they take pictures of it. Um, I really like I like seeing that. And I feel like the amount of wildlife we've seen enter our yard just in the past couple of years has really exploded. Uh, we see crazy amounts of insects. We get monarchs migrating through. Um, we have possums. We have raccoons. We have a variety of birds. We have house wrens and Carolina wrens that nest in the yard. Um, it's really just a wonderful um, experience to to see all of the wildlife really 
just come to your yard if you plant native plants. Um, I do have some videos for you guys too, which hopefully, um, I'm not sure you'll actually be able to hear the audio, but most of them don't have audio anyways. Um, this is a sulfur enjoying our Liatris newlandii in the front yard. Uh, this is one of those plants that's in the front garden that just grabs people's attention immediately. They walk by and they, they stop and they look at all the pollinators that are attracted to it. And we've really started to gather kind of this collection of biodiversity. Um, you know, we've seen uh, both Asian and native mantids. We have camouflage loopers, uh, which are a type of caterpillar. Uh, we have mantis flies, which are a truly unique uh, insect that I'm, I'm not going to attempt to describe here. <laughs> um, we have wool carter bees, which are a non-native, but a, a very cool species that likes our mints. They collect the hairy trichomes of the mints. Um, milkweed beetles, and um, this is a surfid fly larva up here in the corner. Those eat aphids, and uh, surfid flies are really cool pollinators that are definitely underappreciated. And the reason I posted this mostly is just seeing this diversity of insects, um, you know, comes from providing them with resources. And um, this food web really makes our garden just a better place. We have, um, you know, less pests because of it. Our garden is better pollinated. And because of this, we're able to also collect a lot of native seed and propagate those and give them to other people. Um, here are some of the my favorite animals that we've get in our backyard, cardinals, goldfinches, um, our house wrens that nest here. And this little guy in the corner is my <laughs> favorite squirrel. I know they're not a favorite by many, uh, but this is Jinky. Jinky has a damaged tail and it's she's just a fighter, man. She's, she's really um, spry and wily and always getting into trouble. And I love watching the, the squirrels in her backyard. <laughs> so now outside of my backyard, um, there's a lot of really wonderful places to explore in Illinois, but I kind of wanted to ease you into that by showing you that, you know, nature doesn't have to be something that's separate. I think people overlook the value of their own yard and their own, um, their own home and the surrounding properties and your neighbors. And I think that if you encourage wildlife in those areas, you don't have to go very far. And especially in times like a global pandemic, you have nature at your fingertips. Um, if you don't have a place to garden, that's okay because there's many wonderful areas to explore in Illinois. Um, this, this picture on the left is a really nice uh, graphic of the natural divisions of Illinois. So showing kind of like where the glacial deposits are, where the rivers are, and where the bottomlands of those rivers um, and their tributaries show. And also I put a couple of links here that I can post later uh, to the Northern Illinois Guidebook, which is a nice um, website showing lots of different places you can explore in Illinois. And then one of the first books we got when we moved here from a friend was Exploring Nature in Illinois uh, by Illinois natural history biologists Michael Jeffords and Sue Post. And um, it's a really nice exploration of all places uh, in Illinois. And this very cool graphic on the right, I just really like the style of it. It's so vintage and, and colorful. And it kind of has a little highlight for each city um, or town in the in the state. And yeah, it says the state wildflower is violet. We all know, all us cool botanist people know that the violet is passe. We need to change it to the Kankakee Mountain <laughs> or something that's endemic uh, to the state. But anyways, um, I just really liked this graphic and thought it was fun. And um, most of this presentation is going to cover areas that are in the central Illinois area just because of proximity, but there are uh, some different areas that I'm going to cover that go outside of the range of central Illinois. So we're going to travel through a year in Illinois, and of course, as you can guess, the majority of my documentation is going to be in the middle of the year when it's at its peak. Um, but that's not to say that there's not a lot of really wonderful things to explore uh, during the winter. So I come from Buffalo, New York, and I'm definitely no stranger to winter, but I admit that the winters here have been somehow a lot more challenging. Um, I've found it difficult to enjoy them as much because we just don't have the snow in the quantity that I'm used to. So often you get 
those cold winds and the iciness, but you don't quite get the beautiful fluffy snow that I'm used to. Um, but regardless of that, you know, I've, I've found ways to, um, you know, look around and identify areas that kind of highlight the beauty of winter. And one place that really does that is, is our floodplain habitats. Um, you know, you may not be able to go cross country skiing or snowshoeing, um, but you can still go places where you can see kind of the beauty of, of nature in winter. And this day we went out to Sangamon River Forest Preserve, which is one of my favorite places. And the forest was completely flooded and it was basically like a massive ice rink. Um, and a cool thing I learned is that the Sangamon River is 246 miles long. Uh, it stretches all the way from the Illinois River through central Illinois, Springfield and Decatur, all the way to this area. And it was once called the Sangamon River Country in the early settlement of Illinois. Uh, it was such an important river that they called it the Sangamon River Country. And the upper Sangamon between Muhammad and Monticello runs along the face of, um, so kind of to look back at that graphic I showed you a minute ago, these natural divisions, these are going to kind of come into play a couple times in my, my presentation. Um, the Sangamon River kind of runs along the face of this terminal moraine uh, within the Lake Michigan glacial lobe, it's called, which was created about 28,000 to 12,000 years ago. And it was created during the glacial Woodfordian substage, <laughs> uh, where the ice of Lake Michigan, that glacial lobe really quickly advanced. And it left this terminal moraine parallel to the modern Sangamon River. And that's how we have these, these floodplain forests in this area. And this time of year, you know, January, there's not a ton of plant life. So when you're a botanist, it's, it's kind of a tough time to get out and explore. Uh, but there are usually a, an abundance of mosses or lichens, and um, they can be just as cool and fascinating if, if you're into those. Um, but one unique thing I found earlier this year that I had been unfamiliar with were winter stoneflies. Um, this guy on the left here was on a branch really close to my face, <laughs> and I had not really experienced one before. So I did a little bit of research, and there are about 20 um, species that emerge from November through March, but there's about 65 species of stonefly just in Illinois. And they climb trees uh, about this time of year. They, they climb up, they find algae and fungus to eat, they mate, and then they go back down into the stream, they lay their eggs, and then they die. And when the eggs hatch, the stonefly nymphs, the nymphs, they stay in the water until uh, they emerge in November as adults. And so places like the Sangamon are super important because those are, you know, really rich, clean streams that are critical to their um, ability to, to go through this life cycle and this process. Um, so protecting our rivers and our streams are obviously of utmost importance for many reasons, but for the 65 species of native stoneflies in this area, it's, it's critical to their entire life cycle. Also, um, you know, because there's not a lot of plants, uh, a good thing to do this time of year is really focus on birding, of course, winter birding, tree identification. Um, they're really some of the only <laughs> plant life that's available to be seen. And focusing on bark, buds, um, some of these characteristics are really good to hone your um, botany skills. So this tree, which um, I'm sure many of you probably know, is the honey locust or Glitizia triacanthos. And it's such a cool native species. And believe it or not, it's a member of the pea family, Fabaceae. And the thorns grow on the branches um, in an odd way. And they were likely formed and evolved to protect the tree from prehistoric megafauna that used to roam the, the land here before we did, such as the giant sloth um, and some of these other crazy critters. Um, but these animals that used to climb and eat the fruit, which have kind of like a sticky um, syrupy sap inside, um, they probably helped disperse the seeds of, of a lot of these trees beyond their, their native range. All right, now we're moving into February, which hopefully this is giving you some inspiration of things you can do in the next couple of cold uh, COVID months. 
Uh, February is arguably the worst month of the year, probably anywhere, but definitely here. Um, it's just really cold and it seems even though it's the shortest shortest month like it's really long. Um, but if you can make it through the month and find things to, to do to entertain yourself for that month, uh, the rewards are really great because spring here is wonderful. Um, it's a really good time to observe migrating waterfowl and snow geese, uh, bald eagles. And this time of year, I usually drive out to the Illinois River, which is open enough to support different water birds. Um, migratory geese like greater white fronted geese, they come in really large numbers, take advantage of the open water. Um, and it's a major and I think underappreciated migratory flyway of the country. It's arguably one of the most important, certainly for waterfowl that come in through the Great Plains. Um, and something cool I learned is that the Illinois Natural History does some aerial surveys over the upper Illinois River Valley. Um, Aaron Yetter is the person that I, I read about doing a lot of these aerial surveys. And one cool number I found was that just on one day in early January 2019, he counted over 75,000 ducks, 44,800 of which were mallard ducks. Um, that's a lot of ducks. Um, and that's just in the upper uh, Illinois River Valley. That doesn't count the southern part of the state. So I thought that was pretty incredible. Um, so if you go out, um, this is a perfect place to use that driving um, car by birding by car map that I sent you guys. Um, and just check out some of these, you know, open water areas and look for different types of waterfowl and geese. Um, it's a really cool, cool time of year to look for them. Uh, a couple of these photos up top I uh, borrowed from Jeff Bryant, who is gracious enough to let us use a lot of his photos for Audubon stuff. Um, I really love big spectacles. Um, like this past weekend, I went to go see the Sea of Hill Cranes, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, but who doesn't love big spectacles? It's very exciting. Um, Birding the Illinois River is definitely one of the highlights of winter because it's just so cool to see birds in really large numbers. Um, and this is a great place to see them. Uh, when it's open too, I usually like to stop by the Dixon Mounds um, to check out the museum because Illinois has this really rich history of mound building cultures uh, that are prehistoric indigenous inhabitants of, of this area. And over about 5,000 years, these people constructed these amazing earthen mounds. You can see them also at, uh, at Kenny Cook, at Lake Windfall Prairie. Um, and they're just these earthen mounds that are um, were built for you know religious, uh, burial, and residential reasons. And um, yeah, it's a really neat place to to go. And even if the museum's closed, you can get out and walk around the grounds um, and kind of make a day of it to explore a lot of the areas around that region. Okay, we're getting into March. Good stuff is starting to happen. You know, by the end of February, sometimes the, the milder temperatures are starting to break through and the buds on the trees are starting to break. Um, it's finally feeling like things are maybe turning around. You know, definitely by the end of March, it's, it's starting to get to be spring almost. Um, and then once you hit the end of March, it feels like things just accelerate very rapidly. Um, you're trying to keep up with everything in bloom. This photo in particular was taken at um, Allerton on an early spring hike. I, as you guys can probably already tell, I love squirrels. I think they're so cute and hilarious. They're one of the only mammals that you can really see up close and personal um, and just watch them and their antics um, because most mammals are nocturnal or crepuscular or they're just really cryptic and not numerous so you can't see them very often but squirrels they're always around um, and this guy's a fox squirrel so you can tell the difference between the fox squirrel and the gray squirrel because it's got more orangish color um, and a little bit larger as well and they don't normally coexist with gray squirrels or they don't normally occupy the same habitat i assume they have some competition um, but a thing I learned recently that I thought was interesting too is that we know they don't really hibernate. You see them pretty active during the winter, but they can actually sleep for multiple days at a time when it's really dark in winter. And I think that that might have to be a strategy I take up uh, this winter just to sleep for multiple days at a time. <laughs> um, 
It's also a really good time in February and March to head to a local wetland or a floodplain forest because they're usually pretty flooded and you can get a really good look at some of the frogs that are traveling down from upper level areas into vernal pools. So vernal pools are these areas that when floodplain forests are flooded, they fill up with water. And then as it drains, they kind of are uh, creating a depressional pool that usually is uninhabited by fish or other predatory animals that would otherwise eat the eggs of these um, you know, uh, frogs and amphibians or um, salamanders. Um, so it's really important for them to have these small pockets of wet areas. And uh, one of my favorite places to go is Sangamon River Forest Preserve, but also Middle Fork, uh, Meadowbrook Park. You can go to any of these places and, and hear the frogs. Busey Woods also, of course, too. Um, but another great critter that you can see this time of year are woodcocks, American woodcocks, also called uh, timber doodles, the brush snipe, the night partridge, uh, bog sucker, which is an interesting one. They just have a lot of fun common names, but they're also just really unique, adorable. They use that long beak to poke into the ground and collect, uh, you know, like macroinvertebrates and insects to eat. And around this time of year, they start doing a really magnificent mating ritual where they um, kind of fly up into the sky. They do kind of a circular um, flight pattern. And then as they drop to the ground, they make a really strange kind of like whoop sound. I'm not gonna try to describe it, um, but this lacking behavior is, is good to see around dusk. So if you go out to any of these forest preserves where they have been seen around the evening, um, it's a good chance that you might be able to see some doing um, doing their lecking behavior. And in the past, in March, we usually do um, a woodcock walk where we meet up at Meadowbrook and we go out and do a tour with Urbana Park District. Um, that's something that we may not be able to do as a group this year, but I definitely recommend that you go out and, and try on your own. And I do have to put a plug in, of course, too. My friends do a podcast called The Field Guides, which is a wonderful podcast, and they did a really fun episode about the timber doodle. So if that's something you're interested in, um, go check it out. It's called the Field Guides. And I did take a video. Again, I'm not sure you guys are going to be able to hear it, but um, probably not. But basically a chorus of frogs. Um, and this is at Sangamon River Forest Preserve. Um, this is a good spot to see a lot of woodcocks. I do see them going up and doing their behaviors, um, but also just a ton of chorus frogs, cricket frogs. Um, it's, it's a great place to see all of these wildlife. And there's not usually a lot of people there. Um, so it's also really nice. Oh, Laura said she heard it. So I'm gonna play it again and stop talking. <laughs> So it's very quiet, but if you have headphones in, you'll probably be able to hear it even better. In the background, um, so you can hear the frogs kind of as like a low level chorus in the background. And then there's a, a meep. <laughs> that's so embarrassing, I don't even know how to, it's kind of like a, a meep. And that's the sound that the woodcocks make while they're, they're out and walking about and trying to attract ladies. Um, I would say that for me, this is kind of like the meaning, like this is the beginning of spring and it's when I really start getting excited because when the frogs start and the woodcocks start doing their mating rituals, it's like, okay, this is, it's happening now. It's getting warm enough and we're finally going to be able to experience spring, which to me is, is the most exciting time of year. And by the end of March, you're starting to finally see color. Um, it's the time of year when things really start to change and the sun is much more abundant. You know, you don't have as many clouds as you do throughout the winter, which seem to be really ever present. Um, and leeks or wild leeks, wild onions are one of the first native plants that really start popping up in woodlands. So you get this gorgeous reddish green color popping up all over the forest floor. And it's one of the first things that um, breaks up the, the winter landscape. Of course, you also get um, you know, skunk cabbage this time of year, marsh marigold if you're in an area that's wetland. Um, some of those things are starting to, to pop up and uh, skunk cabbage is by far one of the earliest blooming plants 
uh, that you'll see this time of year. Um, some of the other plants that you'll probably start seeing this time of year are um, trees and shrubs starting to come into bloom. So spice bush and service berry. Um, I love the spice bush flowers, which are there in the middle. They are just very small and yellow and they smell really beautiful. Um, we have a service berry in our front yard and it's, it just gets full of blossoms. It's gorgeous. Um, it's also some of the first looks at spring ephemerals. So that usually starts with blood roots, uh, the leeks, and then a favorite of mine, which is the snow trillium, which is a, a trillium I had never met until I moved to Illinois. Uh, it's very minute and small and um, can form kind of dense colonies, uh, but they do usually occur on like uh, cliff sides. I don't want to say cliff sides because we don't really have cliffs here, but um, you know, like in riparian areas, they like those sloping areas where the soil is well drained. And so they are kind of subject to erosion and, and um, degradation of some of those embankments. Um, so just be careful if you're out exploring. And another note, I'm not really gonna mention all the locations of many of the plants that we discuss in this presentation, just because I'm sensitive to um, making sure that we protect them as much as possible. So if you do wanna go out and look for some of these plants, some of the best ways to do it is just do some research and learn about the types of habitats they really like so that you can go out and find them. Um, but there's a lot of great resources, including Illinois Wildflowers uh, website to kind of show you um, a little bit more about our native plants. But yes, yeah, trilliums are by far one of the most exciting spring plants. Um, they're just really beautiful. And we're getting into April. Oh, uh, arguably, you know, true spring. Um, I think the weather can start to get really incredible this time of year. There's um, a lot of days where it's still really chilly, but um, the sun is coming out a little bit more. Everything's warming a little bit. So even though it's cool at night, you get really nice days to get out and get out and explore. Um, so it's kind of the start of spring ephemerals. So spring ephemerals are kind of this class of herbaceous plants that are really early blooming and they are ephemeral, of course, as their name says. So they don't last for very long. Um, they come out and take advantage of early pollinators and take advantage of all of the sunlight they can get before the canopy closes in over them because many of them exist in, in you know, Mid, mid forests where um, the canopy closes in throughout the summer and they can't get quite as much sunlight. So a lot of spring ephemerals have unique ecologies. So um, they can be pollinated by different insects like gnats or uh, flies, uh, insects that come out a little earlier than maybe some of the bees. Um, so wild ginger is an example of a plant that might be primarily pollinated by gnats and flies. Um, but also, a lot of our spring wildflowers have this really cool adaptation called an eliasome, which is a fleshy appendage that is on the outside of the seed coat. And it's full of starch and um, like healthy fats that is really attractive to insects like ants. So they can find these seeds and they'll eat the uh, eliasome off and then they cache or dispose of the seed in kind of like their refuse bin in the, the nest. And by doing that, they're essentially creating, you know, perfect little microclimate um, with compost, essentially, for these seeds to germinate. And so dispersal of a lot of these plants is dependent upon, you know, their, their insect counterpart part, or ants to kind of disperse the seeds for them. Um, some other favorite spring wildflowers that start to bloom this time of year is, of course, prairie trillium, you have Jacob's ladder, uh, spring beauties, bloodroot, spring cress, and uh, trout lily. And they start to kind of come out in succession. Uh, some of them you can see on these embankments, like I was telling you about before. Um, some are more uh, like floodplain forest species. But even spring beauties, for example, you see is kind of almost like a weedy plant in some areas. I know when I drive down Broadway to go to um, UC Woods, they're often like in a complete carpet all across Crystal Lake Park and um, the lawn there. So um, some of them are more abundant than others. I really love how spring beauties have the, the pink pollen on their anthers too, which is really precious. Um, but some cool places to go to see spring wildflowers are, you know, Allerton, um, Fox Ridge is a really nice place to go, Embora, um, 
where like Warbler Ridge, um, Sugar Grove is another favorite of mine to go look for wildflowers in the spring. Um, it's also time of year when tree swallows are flocking back in in large groups. Um, I didn't know, but they actually will gather in really, really large numbers during migration and when they molt, um, kind of as like a protection. So they come in, they start pairing up and taking up nest boxes. It's also, you know, a lot of insects are more abundant. So you're starting to see bees and bumblebees and tiger beetles. Um, and some of the more unique wildflowers, I think are, it's, it's just, all happening at once. It's a very exciting time of year. Um, so this is a blue cohosh, and then we've got Virginia bluebells, um, and then uvularia or bellflowers, which are another favorite wildflower of mine because they're just very diminutive and um, have these nice yellow draping flowers. Uh, it's a good time to go to Heron County Park or a local wetland. There's lots of spring birds that are migrating through. Um, our arrival of the red-winged blackbirds is always very exciting, but you also have migrating waterfowl, you have soras, um, you know, ruby crown kinglets, phoebes, um, brown creepers, and then of course our turtles are starting to come out of brumation. They're getting onto those logs and they're starting to sun themselves and warm themselves up. Um, it's just a, a good time of year to explore wetlands because there's a lot going on. And um, when it comes to birds, you know, end of April is is pretty much like a good time to start seeing birds rolling through. One of the first and earliest spring warblers is blue gray gnat catchers. Um, absolutely a favorite of mine because again it's one of those signs that the times are changing. You know they arrive you start hearing them first up in the canopy and I also just really love their little angry eyebrows. Like <laughs> They always look very serious at, at you. Um, Plus their color is, you know, really striking and it's it's nice to see them early in the year. Unfortunately, in this picture on an autumn olive, but whatever. Um, they're, they're one of the first earliest uh, warblers, except for probably yellow rumped warblers. But I've actually seen last year, throughout the summer, I saw a blue gray gnat catcher nesting in a tree at Hidden Acres, which is one of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District properties. And that was really cool to see. Um, and when it comes to flowers, you can't go wrong, um, but shooting stars, dodecaphion, which you can actually occasionally see at Meadowbrook. Um, you can also go out to any of our sand prairies and potentially get a view of them. Um, but bird's foot violet here on the right is um, just such a beautiful spring wildflower. And to me, you know, again, towards the end of April, you're really starting to see a different array of plants. Also, this is very plant heavy, so thank you for being patient. If you're not a plant person, I hope you enjoy it. Um, I am, I consider myself a botanist and a birder, but um, I'm covering a lot of plants because I take a lot of pictures of plants. Um, okay, so I know I've said this for all of spring, but May is probably the best month, right? Like May is just, um, it's finally beautiful weather. The sun is out almost every day. Um, and things just change so quickly. It's, it's that point of the year where like 100% of my time when I'm not working is spent being outside. So it's out either in my garden um, or out at one of our local parks, just trying to soak it all in. And, and it feels like every day you might miss something if you don't go out and look for it. So um, things are blooming and changing so quickly. You know, bird migration is at peak. Um, and you really do feel like if you don't get out every moment, you're going to miss something. Um, it's just abundance everywhere. It's such a wonderful time of year. Um, this is a hawthorn, by the way, a beautiful hawthorn that I probably saw at Middle Fork, but I can't quite remember. Uh, another thing that's really cool is at Kenny Cook. Um, I can't remember which trail, but if you go up along the Ridge Trail at Kenny Cook, um, there's a lot of rough-legged swallows that will nest in the side of the bank. Um, so it's kind of like a sandy um, dirt sided bank embankment to the river. And um, you can just see them flying and flitting about and catching insects and then heading back to their, their nests, uh, which is a really cool sight that I hadn't seen till this year. And of course, also the wildflowers are starting to change. Um, you're getting some of the more early summer wildflowers like delphinium and camassias, which you can see quite 
uh, abundantly at Allerton. And then um, Blue-Eyed Mary is another sweet, sweet uh, spring wildflower that is uh, just beautiful and, and very different looking. Uh, May is also when our spring bird count happens. Um, so you might see some shorebirds or some of our incoming warblers. Um, I would love to do a quick warbler quiz, but I actually probably one of you can tell me, I can't remember the one on the top left. Um, but on the bottom left, we have a blue-eyed vireo. I believe the middle one is a chipping sparrow. On the top uh, right, we have a palm warbler. And then on the bottom right is uh, the Cheeto bird, as my friend calls it. Looks like he dove into a bag of Cheetos headfirst. That is the Blackburnian warbler, uh, which is certainly one of the most incredible looking warblers that we get that comes through town. Um, and again, it's just peak migration time. So it's, it's very busy. There's a lot to see. Um, this is at Busey Woods, you know, flooded um, forests, like I was saying before, creating those vernal pools that are really important for breeding animals. And everything's just lush. Uh, the leaves are starting to fan out and it's actually starting to get a little more difficult to do some of the birding that we wanna do because the canopy starts filling in. Um, but it's just um, anywhere you go is, is gonna be really lush and green. Another favorite place of mine to visit during early and late spring is um, any of our sand prairies, because the type of wildflowers that you see are different from those that you're going to see in an understory forest. So lupin is one that if you go up to the Indiana Dunes or you go to somewhere like Braidwood or Sand Ridge, um, you're going to see a totally different set of wildflowers, with the exception, of course, of the um, birdsfoot violet. But there's hairy pacoon. Um, there's phlox, there's penstemon. I think this is maybe penstemon pallidus, but um, a little different than your garden variety penstemon. And they're all just stunning. Um, and they, they like a lot of that sandy soil, which makes them uh, less likely to inhabit some of those understory forests. Uh, this past summer uh, at the Sand Prairie, uh, I think we were at Henry Ellen Gleason, I saw my first blue racer uh, they really like the savanna habitat, and this one actually climbed up in a tree to escape when I when I walked by. Um, this type of habitat was likely a lot more widespread um, across the western portion of Illinois before settlization, settlement, colonization. I just combined two words, so set, settlization is a good word. Um, anyways. <laughs> This whole area um, on the western part of Illinois has kind of these um, glacial deposits of, of sand ridges and dunes and blowouts. And so the species that grow there really like that type of um, kind of nutrient poor, sandy and well-drained soil. Um, one cool thing that I learned about Henry Ellen Gleason uh, Park is that there was a extensive floristic assessment that was conducted in 2005 and they noted over 170 plant species just at that one area. So it's really rich and diverse and um, you can see a lot of critters that you don't normally see. And now we're in June. Um, you know, June is when summer really begins for me. I think the weather is pretty consistent and incredible and there's just insects everywhere. The sun shines every day. Um, it's a really nice time to explore any seeps or um, you know, shaded forests because by now the heat is really starting to kick up. Um, so taking refuge in the wet and humid parts of the state is usually a good idea. Uh, so last summer we went out to Howard's Hollow Seep, which is a DNR property within Forest Glen. And it's mostly trailless, but there is um, about an acre portion of this preserve uh, where the hills are, it's, it's you know, hilly. Um, and it's forested, but there's a small ravine that's formed by Willow Creek. And if you get there in early spring, you can see skunk cabbage and marsh marigold, um, but a lot of other nice kind of unique species because of this, um, you know, seep um, humid area where ferns can grow where they don't normally, um, they're not usually very common in the state. Um, and it's really a nice place to bird too. You'll see um, a lot of forest birds, thrushes, uh, vireos, and then of course, damselflies, frogs. I think that's a cricket frog, but I'm not positive. Um, that's a, I think an ebony jewel wing damselfly up in the corner. They're just really colorful and beautiful. They do this little, you know, floating dance over the creek um, 
when they're doing their little mating displays. It's also um, a really good time to explore cemetery prairies. I think Chris Benda did a, a video that you can find on YouTube um, which is kind of like a tour of cemetery prairies of the area. So the reason cemetery prairies are so unique is that they've never been plowed. You know, they contain dead bodies, so you can't plow them. Um, so, so, so they're some of the most pristine prairies that um, represent kind of what Illinois used to look like uh, before modernization. Um, so it's important to note that if you go to any of these cemetery prairies, just be very cautious where you step. You know, they're very unique and delicate ecosystems, and a lot of them harbor some of the most threatened species in the state. Um, but they're really relics of kind of a lost prairie that we don't see a lot in Illinois anymore. Um, you know, of course, our restored prairies are more abundant, and some of my favorites that are kind of close by are um, Sangamon. River Forest Preserve, but there's also Buffalo Trace, um, Meadowbrook, um, the Kankakee Sands Complex has some great prairie habitat, and of course Medeoen. Um, those are other nice places to explore. And of course also the forest understory is just really lush. You know the pawpaws I love because they look very tropical and um, just kind of makes you feel like you're in a tropical paradise during the summer. Another spot I like to go to is the overlook at Forest Glen. So it's probably the, the spot in town where you can get the best uh, view and feel like maybe you're in the mountains for a minute. We don't have a lot of topography here. So it's really nice to be able to see things from a different perspective and to get a view of the canopy from above. Um, Matt uh, took this video via drone. So this is a canopy right next to the Forest Glen Tower, and you can see just a diversity of oaks just in one spot. We have maybe three or four, or maybe even more species of oaks just in one spot. Once you get to July, things are just really at peak, particularly in the garden. There's usually so much going on that I can barely keep up, but it's also that kind of sweet spot of the year where things aren't quite um, over the top, flopping over and overgrown, but they're really, really extravagant. So like the flowers are going off. Um, this is a photo I took when I was up in the Chicago area. I'm not sure exactly where I was. I have to be honest. I was doing work for the Illinois Tollway and we saw these beautiful Turks capillaries. Um, it could have been Psalm Woods, I can't remember. And they just totally blew my mind because, you know, even from being up in the northern area my whole life, I don't think I've ever seen a patch of these lilies. Um, and the color just were amazing. I just loved them. Um, but if you can't get up to the Chicago area, you can still see uh, this patch of Michigan lilies in our local forest preserves. Um, this was a really nice um, patch, just massive patch of lilies that we found. Um, and the cool thing about lilies is they only bloom, like each bloom only blooms for about 24 hours. So some of them will have multiple buds, but if you want to get out and see them, you kind of have to get out and see them quickly because they don't last for very long. So hopefully you guys got, you could hear the birds in the background there too. Yes, there must not be many deer. That's a very good point. If you want to keep your lilies alive, it's a good idea to close them, uh, surround them with, with fencing. Um, they love the taste of lilies, even though they, I, I think, are slightly toxic. But um, you can also um, put fencing in your own yard if you have lilies. But um, fortunately, in Illinois, there's a lot better deer control than many places that I've lived before. Uh, also, it's a really good time for insects. Um, it's a good time to put up your mothing sheet. We've done this with friends before where we, um, they have a much better setup than we do. We have a, a light bulb that I string <laughs> from my clothesline, which is not quite as effective. Um, but I'm not the person to ask, but Trevor Edmondson, who did a presentation a couple months ago, is excellent at taking photos of crazy cool moths that he finds in his backyard or at Kankakee Sands. Um, so definitely check him out. He's got really cool photos. But here's a couple neat insects we found over the summer. This slug caterpillar, which as you can tell by its coloration and the spikiness of it is probably not great to touch or eat if you are an animal. Um, so it's just, it was a really big surprise to me to see these. Uh, I think it was on the back of a pawpaw leaf. 
and um, we were just walking by and somehow it, the colors caught my eye. I thought they were a really unique slug caterpillar I've never seen before. I think maybe they were, yeah, both at Russell M. Duff and Preserve, which is a, a really nice spot to check out as well. Um, summer birds, you know, are kind of nestling in. They, they've got babies by now, and they're not quite as noisy as they were in the spring, so they're harder to find. Uh, we did come across this, um, surprised by this eagle nest um, up in this massive sycamore. Uh, I can't quite remember where. I think it was at a forest preserve district. Um, but some other cool finds of the summer were these monotro monotropa uniflora, or ghost pipe, and um, also some chanterelles, my first chanterelles I've ever seen. Um, there was, we must have just hit the timing right. It must have been right after a rain and there was just an abundance of, of chanterelles to be seen. So that was really cool. Uh, wetland plants are kind of at their peak also. It's a, also because it's so hot, a great time to take a dip in one of our local streams. And when I say a dip, I mean just a tiny dip. Most of our streams unfortunately aren't healthy enough to uh, take a full swim in. Um, just another reason to protect our, our rivers. Um, but this spot was really full of um, mimulus and justitia. So justitia americana is, is called water willow. And also um, mimulus called monkey flower. Is, they're just really cool plants that you don't see too often because we don't have many wetlands around this area. And this patch of justitia is just going crazy. Um, but I think you can probably see them at Heron Park, you know, a nice wetland area. And then um, Kenny Cook, uh, has some nice streams through it as well. Uh, I think one of the best places to go during the summer is the Kinkakee Sands Complex. It's probably one of the un most unique and special areas that we have in our state. Uh, the black oak savannas in the area are um, some of the left, like last remaining types of habitat left. Um, so I think this is Pembroke Township, um, which is part of that Kinkakee Sands Complex. And this is another drone video that Matt took. And what's cool about this area is this is all part of the sands that, remember I was talking about earlier with um, the marine. These are sands that were deposited as part of the Kinkakee Torrent, which was this massive cast catastrophic flood that occurred about 19,000 years ago. And it was the result of this like breach of the giant glacial lake, Lake Chicago. And the flood was caused by melting of the Wisconsin ice sheets. So the results of this flood, can, it's really cool if you look at like topographic imagery or um, digital elevation models of the state because you can see the actual kind of extent of where that flood happened because it just left all these deposits and um, you know sand, sand hills and till plain behind. Um, There's also, when we first moved here, a really cool documentary that was uh, stream, streamed or screened at the late and great um, art theater you know, rest in peace to the art theater. Um, but I think you can probably find it online or on YouTube um, or maybe purchase a copy somewhere. It was called The Everglades of the North, the story of the Grand Kinkakee Marsh. And it tells this really wonderful story of the history of the area and why it's so unique um, and why it deserves protection. Because it really is, um, of course, with the black oaks and then uh, all the other prairie species that live there, uh, it's just very unique and um, not common to find habitats like this throughout the state. Um, once you start getting into August, the color is phenomenal. It's yellow and purple season and um, the full color of the prairie just starts going off and the wildflowers are amazing. Um, and honestly, you can really go anywhere this time of year because there's not a bad place to hike. You know, whether you're in the forest, it's nice and cool. There's lots of um, foliage and it's lush. Or if you go out to the prairie, there's just tons of stuff in bloom. Um, birds are often like feeding young still. So common yellow throats are all over the prairie. Um, dick thistles, meadow larks. I saw this amazing caterpillar out at Sangamon last summer. Um, you know, aster season. You got ironweed, all the sylphiums like compass plant and cut plant. They're going crazy. You've got the gentians. Um, and another one of my favorite fall wildflowers is Helianthus mollis, which is um, uh, just the colors of it are really nice compared to some of the other Helianthus. It's got these really happy, cheerful yellow flowers. And then the stems are kind of hairy and uh, kind of like a powdery green 
with a little bit of a purple stem and they're just really beautiful. Um, this is by far my favorite time on the prairie because the colors are just are really wonderful. Um, another thing we did this summer because we couldn't really go anywhere, uh, we decided to just finally get out and take a small camping trip. We went up to the Driftless area, which we've always wanted to explore. So this area of Northwest Illinois was unglaciated. So there's some really interesting um, topography. So you have uh, rock ledges and uh, rock faces and streams. Uh, we went to Palisades State Park and uh, there was just so many different unique plants. It was nice to kind of get down into the stream areas and see some water, which we don't have uh, a lot of in this area, at least not lakes or um, anything like that. But some of the plants that we saw were really unique because these habitats are kind of like a, a microclimate for plants that really like wetness or humidity. Um, so the rock faces really provide this microclimate. And there's probably some audio here, but uh, this is a spot along one of the riverbeds that had this large rock face and really unique plants. Uh, Deaf camas and coolwort were two new species for me this year, but they're just nestled in there with all of these ferns and liverworts, and um, it's just a really, really different uh, thing to see in Illinois. You know, we're used to a specific type of habitat here in central Illinois, and by going up, up in the northwest, you see a totally different type of habitat, more similar to what um, reminds me of some places from New York or even um, parts of su southern Illinois where you get more of that topography. Also, there's some of the um, most incredible prairies I've ever seen up in the Driftless area. Um, we've got a Silene here, bright and red, that's a catch fly, um, some different Coreopsis and um, probably Rudbeckias. Um, these are probably a lot of them are remnant prairies, but some of them are also probably restored prairies. And there's just a massive diversity of wildflowers here. Um, I took a couple of videos. So you can hear me stomping through the prairie. So all of these pink flowers you see in the background, um, there's a lot of Monarda punctata, spotted bee balm, but there's also this bright pink flower that we don't usually get down this far south called Calaroe, and it's a, it's a poppy uh, that I hadn't really heard about until this year, and we do have a couple that were started from seed um, from a friend in our garden and they are just loved by pollinators. Um, but you can see the structure of this prairie is just a little bit different from that we usually see. It's a lot shorter. It's not quite as tall as the tall grass prairies we have around here. Um, a lot more you know, flowering plants, um, not as many tall grasses. At the end, I really like it because a katydid just kind of flies right by the camera. I don't remember the name of this prairie, Laura, I'm sorry, but there are a couple really nice ones up um, kind of along that route along the Illinois River when you're coming back down from the Northwest Driftless area. I genuinely cannot remember the name of the prairie, I apologize. Uh, September is great because you're still seeing a lot of wildflowers. Um, it's particularly great to go to Sand Ridge State Park or some of our sand prairies. Um, this is a, a fritillary, I can't remember which one, um, one of the more unusual fritillaries that I was very excited to see this summer. Um, it's just a really abundant time of year. Um, the liatris are in full bloom. Again, it's that season of purple and yellow. I really like this crab spider uh, with this wrinkly butt up in the top left, this little pygmy grasshopper. And um, these are all on a liatris aspera over here in the corner. Um, I think this is called clammy weed, which is a really fun aster uh, that likes these sand prairie habitats. When you when you smell the foliage, it smells kind of lemony. Uh, it's got this like resinous sap on the outside of the leaves. Um, who knows if it's just for anti-herbivory or if it maybe has another purpose beyond that. Um, also, this really cool plant in the bottom right, which reminds me of a poinsettia, a uh, Christmas flower, which of course makes sense because it is in the same uh, gene, well, same family. Uh, it's a U4BAC. And I like this just small little smattering of red around the base of the flowers there. Very unique plant and uh, a favorite in the area. 
Also a great place to see um, prickly pear, uh, which is our native uh, Aponchiad. And this time of year, they start to fruit. Um, earlier in the year, around June, you can see them in bloom if you go to places like our sand prairies or up to the Indiana dunes. The blooms are incredible. They're like a yellowish orange color, um, but also some really nice solidagos and um, prairie cicadas, which, you know, we're usually, we usually experience in the city, at least the seasonal cicadas are the periodic cicadas. Um, but this cicada is a little bit different. And I think I have a video coming up. Um, just a beautiful scene at the sand prairie. The colors are the best and um, the weather this time of year is not quite as hot as in July, but sometimes it's still pretty brutal. And here is a video of the prairie cicada. I am warning you guys, it's probably gonna be very loud. <laughs> so prepare your ears, but it is, um, this guy was right next to me on this, um, that's a sumac, I'm blanking on the name, but the sumac, he was just going crazy. Oh, thank you, Mark. Yes. Fragrant. Yeah, fragrant. Yeah. So this was a fun surprise because you can kind of hear them off in the distance usually when you go out to the sand prairies, but I hadn't really seen one up close. And you know, you try to get close to one and take a picture and of course they, they fly away. But this guy was right next to me and he was just screaming in my ear. It was very loud, but a very fun sight. So this prairie cicada is very specific to these types of habitats. Also, I saw my first fox snake in the state. At first, I thought it was a prairie snake, um, but a friend informed me that it's actually a fox snake. And it, it climbed up into a tree when it saw us coming, just like that racer that I showed you earlier. So apparently, that's a very common escape strategy for some of our prairie snakes. Uh, this time of year is great to explore um, any, any of the sand prairies, but Kenny Cook is a nice spot to go to as well. Um, by now, you know, unfortunately, end of September, you're starting to get into that time of the year where it's it's starting to color up. You're losing the green and you're starting to get the yellows and the oranges, um, you know, kind of still getting some flowers, but um, starting to trail off towards uh, as fall starts kicking up. And by October, you know, it's starting to really look like fall, uh, which is, is still really wonderful. The weather is usually great, at least through November, mid, sometimes up to mid-November. Um, this was taken at the Overlook at Middle Fork, if you go to the wild uh, waterfowl area. Um, it's a really nice wetland complex over there that's an important breeding area for our waterfowl. And it's actually protected from hunting as well. Um, this, this was just a really nice day at um, Warbler Ridge. It's just very sunny and a nice, a nice fall day. Um, by the end of October, you're really starting to see a lot of color. I think most of these, um, actually some of th this is a sumac over here, coloring up in red. And then this picture was taken at Hidden Acres, another one of our Champaign County Forest Preserve districts. Um, just really beautiful um, fall colors. You know, we get some different coloration in our forest than some of the northern forests where maybe you see more maples uh, and you see a lot more red. Here we get a lot of yellows and oranges and some of the browns and greens from our oaks and hickories. I also really like to go out um, at Kickapoo and rent a canoe and get out on the water and see the foliage from, from a distance. Uh, see some of our frogs that are holding on on the last warm days that we have. Um, and this time of year, witch hazel starts to bloom. So witch hazel is kind of odd that it blooms in the fall instead of in the spring. Um, but if you look at this tiny, tiny picture on the side here, you'll see the kind of strange uh, blooms of witch hazel. Um, this isn't quite Illinois, but we did take a trip out to Portland Arch to go explore, um, again, looking for places with a little bit of topography. And I would say this is probably one of my favorite hikes of the whole year. The, the fall color was perfect. Again, you get a little bit of um, ele elevation change and you get to kind of climb some of these um, natural bridges that are created by the rocks and the um, 
geology there. So there's also some really tall oaks and tall trees. Um, you get to see vaccinium, uh, which is blueberry and um, different trees and shrubs that you don't normally get a uh, chance to see. This is in Indiana, so it's just over the border. Um, probably not that far from Turkey Run, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it was my first um, time seeing native Euonymus. Uh, so I, I was really impressed by the color and the beauty of it. We also saw a ton of pawpaws there, um, just lots of really unique plants. And earlier in the summer, you'll see some different types of trilliums, um, different summer and spring wildflowers. And again, it's just right over the border, but you get a little bit more of the topography that you don't see in Illinois. Uh, this was another drone shot taken. Uh, this, I think, was at Hidden Acres at peak, um, peak fall color. And it's just a nice, a nice view of our fall forests. I really like these drone videos because you see the forest from a totally different perspective. Um, you can see all of the diversity of trees that are harder to see from the ground level. So then you start getting into November and kind of not quite winter, but it's starting to creep in on us. Um, one of the things we do usually as a group for Champaign County Audubon is we go to Jasper Pulaski to see the cranes. Um, I did go this year and hopefully some of you guys did too. If you didn't go yet, it's not too late. There was over 25,000 this past week. Um, so they're still traveling through. Um, you know, the, the forests are definitely um, starting to dwindle you're seeing a lot more uh, withering and falling of the, the leaves, um, but you still have some color hanging on. It's just such a different tone than what you see in the summer. You know, it changes from green to kind of like a, a yellowish uh, tone in the forest. And it kind of just marks for me that, that summer is over and fall is here. Um, but on our way out to Jasper Pulaski, we stopped at the Kinkakee Sands. Uh, bison viewing area and we were so lucky because there was bisons right up next to the fence and this complex is part of that mass massive complex of Kinkakee Sands that I described earlier where the black oak savanna and, and all of that is kind of part of one big complex of uh, protected areas and this Kinkakee Sands area is if you were um, here for our October speaker Trevor Edmondson he talked about this um, restoration they've been doing here as part of the Nature Conservancy um, so this bison viewing area, I don't know how many there are, but there's there's quite a lot. And they were surprisingly all in one massive group. Um, this little guy was right up next to the fence, just hanging out, chomping on some grass, and generally just minding his own business and not minding that we were um, in abundance kind of taking pictures of him. There was a lot of people lined up at the fence trying to get his picture because he was so handsome. There was also some common red poles. You know, you can't stop the birders from birding. And um, there was a, a couple trees in the prairie area on top of the trail that you could see some common red poles. And they, they come down during the winter in different years. Again, we were talking about this winter being kind of an eruptive year for finches and different birds. And um, they're just one example of a bird that we don't really see that commonly down in Champaign. Um, very exciting. And, um, of course, there's some some fall beauty of some goldenrod, Solidago canadensis. Um, I don't actually have a picture of the massive sandhill crane migration because I just my camera isn't good enough to take pictures like that. Um, but I I did post a couple to the Champaign County Audubon Facebook page, and it's really a cool experience because you. Um, so Jasper Pulaski in Indiana is where you can usually go, but any of the surrounding agricultural fields or um, kind of floodplain areas is where they congregate. So during the day they disperse, they go out, they look for corn, uh, leftover corn, which is the majority of their diet while they're on migration. And they come through, they eat all the corn that they can find, all the um, insects probably too that they can find. And so as you drive through the area, you can kind of see little pockets of, of cranes gathered in the fields. 
And then around dusk, which of course, unfortunately now is like 4.30 in the afternoon, you can go over to an observation deck where there's kind of like a viewing area that's protected and fenced off so that there's no hunting allowed on the preserve. And everybody gathers there this time of year and they travel from all over to come see these cranes migrating through on their way down south for the, for the winter. And the uh, Indiana Department of Natural Resources has kind of like a weekly toll that they keep and they keep track of all of the birds that come through and act, like kind of congregate at night so the birds come in from all the surrounding areas where they've been feeding and eating all day long and they gather at this one roosting spot for the night and that kind of protects them from predators as you can imagine even though they're very large birds um, they're still a favorite of probably a lot of nighttime predators like coyotes um, so they do this for safety and probably for warmth too because it's pretty chilly in the evenings so they congregate in large numbers. And like I said, this past week, I think there was over 25,000. So even if you go within uh, the next week or so, you still should be able to um, you know, witness kind of a, a big flock of birds. And like I said, I love big spectacles because who doesn't? It's very exciting. Um, everybody's you know, bundled up and they have their big cameras and their scopes just trying to get a, a good shot of the birds. And um, it's, they sound like if you can imagine what a dinosaur would sound like, that's what they sound like. Very prehistoric. <laughs> um, it's very cool. So yes, I, I highly recommend getting out to do that in the next week or so if you can. You know, and then that brings us to kind of the close of the year. You know, now that um, November's over, we're in December, and we don't often get a lot of snow, but um, this uh, last December, we had a really nice snowstorm and we headed out to Kickapoo and did some exploring. And I really like snowy hikes at Kickapoo because they have these awesome uh, carved spirit faces that, they're, that are hanging on the trees on this one trail. Uh, they call it Spooky Hollow. And I think it's called Clear Lake Trail. These were all these little installations that were created by the Kickapoo Carvers Wood Carving Club. And um, they just really make me smile. There's a bunch of differently carved faces, some with kind of angry faces, some with kind of surprised and, and goofy faces. Um, and they line this uh, trail of pines that are along this uh, kind of ridged trail. And it's just a really fun experience. There's a bunch of small, unique little um, Easter eggs all over the trail. And it was just a really nice hike because again, it reminded me kind of the snow we get at home, this really fluffy, big, lake effect snow. And I actually was able to put on my snow pants for once and get out and explore. So, um, you know, hopefully this has inspired you to get out and check out some areas that maybe you've never checked out before. Maybe you've lived here your whole life and you're saying to yourself, I have not seen any of these things. Or maybe you're new to the area and you um, haven't quite figured out where to explore yet. Um, and the, like I said earlier, you know, if you love the outdoors and you love nature, um, you can really find something to love anywhere you live. And it's always been kind of sad to me to hear grad students or other people who move to the area and they're like, this isn't real hiking. There's no mountains or, you know, whatever. It's, it's like, well, if that's what you're looking for, you're not going to find it here. But there's a lot of other wonderful things that you can find too. Really unique plants and insects. And, um, you know, I think that's really worth celebrating and exploring. So hopefully some of this has inspired you to go out and check new places. And again, of course, um, that shouldn't stop you from, you know, just because there's a lot of nature around you shouldn't stop you from creating nature in your own backyard. And I just wanted to share this video, really. That's why, that's why I put it here. We had um, a ton of monarchs come through our yard this year. And I had been really disheartened earlier in the year because we hadn't really seen that many. And I was starting to worry that maybe, ooh, this video is kind of lagging. I was starting to worry that maybe they weren't doing as well and we weren't gonna see too many breeding in our yard. And then we had this massive group of monarchs come by and stop at our liatris in the front yard. And they, I think maybe at peak were in the twenties or thirties for the amount of monarchs we saw in one day. And again, it's just a good reminder that 
you don't have to just, I mean, yes, preserving natural areas is really important, but creating habitat in your own backyard is just as important because we can create that patchwork of habitat to connect all those larger natural areas um, and make it a lot easier for these animals that, that really are struggling to find habitat in some places like Illinois, where we, we don't have a lot of nature left. Um, and with that, go out and do some gardening and <laughs> plant some flowers and smell some flowers. And um, thanks, for, thanks for coming to my talk. If you guys have any questions, I will um, open it up to questions. <laughs>